All right, welcome back to the story of King Arthur and his knights by Howard Pyle. We are on part two, chapter the third. How King Arthur found a noble sword in a very wonderful manner, and how he again fought with it and won that battle. Now, as soon as King Arthur had, by means of that extraordinary balm, been thus healed of those grievous wounds which he had received in his battle with King Pellinore, he found himself to be moved by a most vehement desire to meet his enemy again, for to try issue of battle with him once more, and so recover the credit which he had lost in that combat. Now, upon the morning of the fourth day, being entirely cured, and having broken his fast, he walked for refreshment beside the skirts of the forest, listening the while to the cheerful sound of the woodbirds singing their matins, all with might and main. And Merlin walked beside him, and King Arthur spake his mind to Merlin concerning his intent to engage once more in knightly contest with King Pellinore. And he said, Merlin, it doth vex me very sorely for to have come off so ill in my late encounter with King Pellinore. <laughs> Certes, he is the very best knight in all the world whom I have ever yet encountered. Nevertheless, it might have fared differently with me had I not broken my sword, and so left myself altogether defenseless in that respect. Howsoever that may be, I am of a mind for to assay this adventure once more, and so will I do as immediately as may be. Thereunto Merlin made reply, Thou art assuredly a very brave man to have so much appetite for battle, seeing how nigh thou camest unto thy death not even four days ago. Yet how mayest thou hope to undertake this adventure without due preparation? For lo, thou hast no sword, nor hast thou a spear, nor hast thou even thy misericordia, for to do battle with all. How then mayest thou hope for to assay this adventure? And King Arthur said, That I know not. Nevertheless, I will presently seek for some weapon as soon as may be. For even and I have no better weapon than an oaken cudgel, yet would I assay this battle again with so poor a tool as that. Ha, Lord, said Merlin, I do perceive that thou art altogether fixed in thy purpose for to renew this quarrel. Wherefore, I will not seek to stay thee therefrom, but will do all that in me lies for to aid thee in thy desires. Now, to this end, I must tell thee that in one part of this forest, which is indeed a very strange place. There is a certain woodland, sometimes called Aroy, and other times called the Forest of Adventure. For no knight ever entereth therein, but some adventure befalleth him. And close to Aroy is a land of enchantment, which has several times been seen. And that is a very wonderful land, for there is in it a wide and considerable lake, which is also of enchantment. And in the centre of that lake, there hath for some time been seen the appearance as of a woman's arm, exceedingly beautiful, and clad in white samite. And the hand of this arm holdeth a sword of such exceeding excellence and beauty that no eye hath ever beheld its like. And the name of this sword is Excalibur. It being so named by those who have beheld it because of its marvellous brightness and beauty, for it hath come to pass that several knights have already seen that sword, and have endeavoured to obtain it for their own. 
but heretofore no one hath been able to touch it, and many have lost their lives in that adventure. For when any man draweth near unto it, either he sinks into that lake, or else the arm disappeareth entirely, or else it is withdrawn beneath the lake. Wherefore no man hath ever been able to obtain the possession of that sword. Now I am able to conduct thee unto that lake of enchantment, and there thou mayest see Excalibur with thine own eyes. Then, when thou hast seen him, thou mayest haply have the desire to obtain him, which, an thou art able to do, thou wilt have a sword very fitted for to do battle with. Merlin, quoth the king, this is a very strange thing which thou tellest me. Now I am desirous beyond measure. For to attempt to obtain this sword for mine own. Wherefore I do beseech thee to lead me with all dispatch to this enchanted lake wherefore thou tellest me. And Merlin said, I will do so. So that morning King Arthur and Merlin took leave of that holy hermit, the king having kneeled in the grass to receive his benediction. And so, departing from that place, they entered the deeper forest once more, but taking their way to that part which was known as Arroy. And after a while they came to Arroy, and it was about noontide. And when they had entered into those woodlands, they came to a certain little open place, and in that place they beheld a white doe with a golden collar about its neck. And King Arthur said, Look, Merlin, yonder is a wonderful sight. And Merlin said, Let us follow that doe. And upon this the doe turned, and they followed it. And by and by in following it they came to an opening in the trees, where was a little lawn of sweet soft grass. Here they beheld a bower, and before the bower was a table spread with a fair snow-white cloth, and set with refreshments of white bread, wine, and meats of several sorts. And at the door of this bower there stood a page, clad all in green, and his hair was as black as ebony, and his eyes as black as jet, and exceedingly bright. And when the page beheld King Arthur and Merlin, he gave them greeting and welcomed the king very pleasantly, saying, Ha! King Arthur, thou art welcome to this place. Now I prithee dismount and refresh thyself before going farther. Then was King Arthur a doubt as to whether there might not be some enchantment in this for to work him an ill. For he was astonished that that page in the deep forest should know him so well. <laughs> but Merlin bade him have good cheer, and he said, Indeed, Lord, thou mayest freely partake of that refreshment which, I may tell thee, was prepared especially for thee. Moreover, in this Thou mayest foretell a very happy issue unto this adventure. So King Arthur sat down to the table with great comfort of heart, for he was a hungered, and that page and another like unto him ministered unto his needs, serving him all the food upon silver plates, and all the wine in golden goblets, as he was used to being served in his own court. Only that those things were much more cunningly wrought than fashioned, and were more beautiful than the table furniture of the king's court. Then, after he had eaten his fill, and had washed his hands from a silver basin, which the first page offered to him, and had wiped his hands upon a fine linen napkin which the other page brought unto him, and after Merlin had also refreshed himself, they went their way, greatly rejoicing at this pleasant adventure, which it seemed to the king could not but betoken a very good issue to his undertaking. Now, about the middle of the afternoon, King Arthur and Merlin came, of a sudden, out from the forest and upon a fair and level plain, bedighted all over with such a number of flowers that no man could conceive of their quantity, nor of the beauty thereof. And this was a very wonderful land, for lo, all the air appeared as it were to be as of gold. So bright was it, and so singularly radiant, 
and here and there upon that plain were sundry trees all in blossom, and the fragrance of the blossoms was so sweet that the king had never smelt any fragrance like to it. And in the branches of those trees were a multitude of birds of many colors, and the melody of their singing ravished the heart of the hearer. And midway in the plain was a lake of water, as bright as silver, and all around the borders of the lake were incredible numbers of lilies and of daffodils. Yet although this place was so exceedingly fair, there was nevertheless nowhere about it a single sign of human life of any sort, but it appeared altogether as lonely as the hollow sky upon a day of summer. So because of all the marvelous beauty of this place, and because of its strangeness and its entire solitude, King Arthur perceived that he must have come into a land of powerful enchantment, where happily dwelt a fairy of very exalted quality. Wherefore his spirit was enwrapped in a manner of fear, as he pushed his great milk-white war-horse through that long fair grass, all bedight with flowers, and he wist not what strange things were about to befall him. So, when he had come unto the margin of the lake, he beheld there the miracle that Merlin had told him of aforetime. For lo, in the midst of the expanse of water, there was the appearance of a fair and beautiful arm, as of a woman clad all in white samite. And the arm was encircled with several bracelets of wrought gold, and the hand held a sword of marvelous workmanship, aloft in the air above the surface of the water, and neither the arm nor the sword moved so much as a hair's breadth, but were motionless, like to a carven image upon the surface of the lake. And behold, the sun of that strange land shone down upon the hilt of the sword, and it was of pure gold beset with jewels of several sorts, so that the hilt of the sword and the bracelets that encircled the arm glistered in the midst of the lake like to some singular star of exceeding splendor. And King Arthur sat upon his warhorse and gazed from a distance at the arm and the sword, and he greatly marveled thereat, yet he wist not know how he might come at that sword, for the lake was wonderfully wide and deep. Wherefore he knew not how he might come thereunto, for to make it his own. And as he sat pondering this thing within himself, he was suddenly aware of a strange lady, who approached him through those tall flowers that bloomed along the margin of the lake. And when he perceived her coming toward him, he quickly dismounted from his war-horse, and he went forward for to meet her with the bridle rein over his arm. And when he had come nigh to her, he perceived that she was extraordinarily beautiful, and that her face was like wax for clearness, and that her eyes were perfectly black, and that they were as bright and glistening as though they were two jewels set in ivory. And he perceived that her hair was like silk, and as black as it was possible to be, and so long that it reached unto the ground as she walked. And the lady was clad all in green, only that a fine cord of crimson and gold was interwoven into the plaits of her hair, and around her neck there hung a very beautiful necklace of several strands of opal stones and emeralds, set in cunningly wrought gold, and around her wrists were bracelets of the like sort, of opal stones and emeralds, set unto gold. And when King Arthur beheld her wonderful appearance, that it was like to an ivory statue of exceeding beauty clad all in green, he immediately kneeled before him in the midst of all those flowers, and he said, Lady, I do certainly perceive that thou art no mortal damsel, but that thou art fay. Also, that this place, because of its extraordinary beauty, can be no other than some land of fairy unto which I have entered. And the lady answered, King Arthur, 
thou sayest soothly, for I am indeed a fairy. Moreover, I may tell thee that my name is Nimue, and that I am the chiefest of those ladies of the lake of whom thou mayst have heard people speak. Also, thou art to know that what thou beholdest yonder as a wide lake is in truth a plain like unto this, all bedight with flowers. And likewise thou art to know that in the midst of that plain there standeth a castle of white marble and of ultramarine illuminated with gold. But lest mortal eyes should behold our dwelling place, my sisters and I have caused it to be that in this appearance as of a lake should extend all over that castle, so that it is entirely hidden from sight. Nor may any mortal man cross that lake, saving in one way, otherwise he shall certainly perish therein. Lady, said King Arthur, that which thou tellest me causes me to wonder a very great deal, and indeed I am afraid then coming hitherward I have been doing amiss for to intrude upon the solitude of your dwelling place. Nay, not so, King Arthur, said the Lady of the Lake, for in truth thou art very welcome hereunto. Moreover, I may tell thee that I have a greater friendliness for thee and those noble knights of thy court than thou canst easily wot of. But I do beseech thee of thy courtesy, for to tell me, what is it that brings thee to our land? Lady, quoth the king, I will tell thee the entire truth. I fought of late a battle with a certain sable knight, in the which I was sorely and grievously wounded, and wherein I burst my spear and snapped my sword and lost even my misericordia, so that I had not a single thing left me by way of which of a weapon. In this extremity Merlin, here, told me of Excalibur, and of how he is continually upheld by an arm in the midst of this magical lake. So I came hither, and behold, I find it even as he hath said. Now, lady, an it be possible, I should fain achieve that excellent sword, that by means of it I might fight my battle to its entire end. Ha, ah, my lord, said the Lady of the Lake, that sword is no easy thing for to achieve. And moreover, I may tell thee that several knights have lost their lives by attempting that which thou hast a mind to do. For in sooth, no man may win yonder sword unless he be without fear and without reproach. Alas, lady, quoth King Arthur, that is indeed a sad saying for me. For though I may not lack in knightly courage, yet in truth there be many things wherewith I do reproach myself withal. Natheless, I would fain attempt this thing, even an it be to my great endangerment. Wherefore, I prithee tell me how I may best undertake this adventure. King Arthur, said the Lady of the Lake, I will do what I say to aid thee in thy wishes in this matter, whereupon she lifted a single emerald that hung by a small chain of gold at her girdle, and lo, the emerald was cunningly carved into the form of a whistle, and she set the whistle to her lips and blew upon it very shrilly, then straight away there appeared upon the water a great way off, a certain thing that shone very brightly and this drew near with great speed. And as it came nigh, behold, it was a boat, all of carven brass. And the prow of the boat was carved into the form of a head of a beautiful woman. And upon either side were wings, like the wings of a swan. And the boat moved upon the water like a swan, very swiftly. So that long lines, like the silver threads, stretched far away behind across the face of the water, which otherwise was like unto glass for smoothness. And when the brazen boat had reached the bank, it rested there and moved no more. Then the lady of the lake bade King Arthur to enter the boat, and so he entered it. And immediately 
he had done so, the boat moved away from the bank as swiftly as it had come thither, and Merlin and the Lady of the Lake stood upon the margin of the water and gazed after King Arthur and the brazen boat. And King Arthur beheld that the boat floated swiftly across the lake to where was the arm uplifting the sword, and that the arm and the sword moved not, but remained where they were. Then King Arthur reached forth and took the sword in his hand, and immediately the arm disappeared beneath the water. And King Arthur held the sword and the scabbard thereof, and the belt thereof in his hand, and lo, they were his own. Then verily his heart swelled with joy, and it would burst within his bosom, for Excalibur was a hundred times more beautiful than he had thought possible. Wherefore his heart was nigh breaking with for pure joy at having obtained that magic sword. Then the brazen boat bore him very quickly back to the land again, and he stepped ashore where stood the Lady of the Lake and Merlin. And when he stood upon the shore, he gave the lady great thanks beyond measure for all that she had done for to aid him in his great undertaking, and she gave him cheerful and pleasing words in reply. Then King Arthur saluted the lady as became him, and having mounted his war horse, and Merlin having mounted his palfrey, they rode away thence upon their business, the king's heart still greatly expanded and pure delight at having for his own that beautiful sword, the most beautiful and the most famous sword in all the world. That night, King Arthur and Merlin abided with the holy hermit at the forest sanctuary, and when the next morning had come, the king, having bathed himself in the ice-cold forest fountain, and being exceedingly refreshed thereby, they took their departure, offering thanks to that saintly man for their harborage he had given them. Anon, about noontide, they reached the valley of the sable knight, and there were all things appointed exactly as when King Arthur had been there before, to wit, that gloomy castle, the lawn of smooth grass, the apple tree, covered over with shields, and the bridge whereon hung that single shield of sable. Now Merlin, quoth King Arthur, I do this time most strictly forbid thee for to interfere in this quarrel, nor shalt thou, under pain of my displeasure, exert any of thy arts of magic in my behalf. So hearken thou to what I say, and heed it with all possible diligence. Thereupon, straightway, the king rode forth upon the bridge, and seizing the brazen maul, he smote upon the sable shield with all his might and main. Immediately, the portcullis of the castle was let fall as aforetold, and in the same manner as that other time, the sable knight rode forth therefrom, already bedighted and equipped for the encounter. So he came to the bridgehead, and there King Arthur spake to him in this wise, Sir Pellinore, we do know each other entirely well, and each doth judge that he hath cause of quarrel with the other. Thou that I, for mine own reason, as seemed to me to be fit, have taken away from thee thy kingly estate, and have driven thee unto this forest solitude. I, that thou hast set thyself up here for to do injury and affront to knights and lords and other people of this kingdom of mine. Wherefore, seeing that I am here as an errant knight, I do challenge thee for to fight with me man to man, until either thou or I have conquered the other. Unto this speech, King Pellinore bowed his head in obedience, and whereupon he wheeled his horse, and riding to some little distance, took his place where he had afore stood. And King Arthur also rode to some little distance, and took his station where he had afore stood. At the same time, there came forth from the castle one of those tall pages, clad all in sable, pied with crimson, and gave to King Arthur a good stout spear of ash wood, well seasoned and untried in battle. And when the two knights were duly prepared, 
They shouted and drave their horses together, the one smiting the other so fairly in the midst of his defense that the spears shivered in the hand of each, bursting all into small splinters as they had aforetime done. Then each of these two knights immediately voided his horse with great skill and address, and drew each his sword, and thereupon they fell to at a combat, so furious and so violent, that two wild bulls upon the mountains could not have engaged in a more desperate encounter. But now, having Excalibur for to aid him in his battle, King Arthur soon overcame his enemy, for he gave him several wounds, and yet received none himself. Nor did he shed a single drop of blood in all that fight, though his enemy's armor was in a little while all stained with crimson. And at last King Arthur delivered so vehement a stroke that King Pellinore was entirely benumbed thereby. Wherefore his sword and his shield fell down from their defense. His thighs trembled beneath him, and he sank unto his knees upon the ground. Then he called upon King Arthur to have mercy, saying, Spare my life, and I will yield myself unto thee. And King Arthur said, I will spare thee. And I will do more than that, for now that thou hast yielded thyself unto me, lo, I will restore unto thee thy power and estate. For I bear no ill will toward thee, Pellinore. Natheless, I can brook no rebels against my power in this realm. For as God judges me, I do declare that I hold singly in my sight the good of the people of my kingdom. Wherefore, he who is against me is also against them. And he who is against them is also against me. But now that thou hast acknowledged me, I will take thee into my favor, only as a pledge of thy good faith toward me in the future. I shall require it of thee that thou shalt send me a hostage of thy good will. Thy two oldest sons, to wit Sir Aglabal and Sir Lamarack, thy young son Dornar, thou mayest keep with thee for thy comfort. So those two young knights, above mentioned, came to the court of King Arthur, and they became very famous knights, and by and by were made fellows in great honor of the round table. And King Arthur and King Pellinore went together into the castle of King Pellinore, and there King Pellinore's wounds were dressed, and he was made comfortable. That night King Arthur abode in the castle of King Pellinore, and when the next morning had come, he and Merlin returned unto the court of the king, where it awaited him in the forest at that place where he had established it. Now King Arthur took very great pleasure unto himself as he and Merlin rode together and returned through that forest, for it was all the leafiest time of all the year, what time the woodlands decked themselves in their best apparel of clear, bright green. Each bosky dell and dingle was full of the perfume of the thickets, and in every tangled depth the small bird sang with all his might and main, and as though he would burst his little throat with the melody of his singing. And the ground beneath the horse's feet were so soft with fragrant moss that the ear could not hear any sound of hoofbeats upon the earth. And the bright yellow sunlight came down through the leaves, so that all the ground was scattered over with a great multitude of trembling circles as of pure yellow gold. And anon, that sunlight would fall down upon the armed knight as he rode, so that every little while his armor appeared to catch fire with a great glory, shining like a sudden bright star amid the dark shadows of the woodland. So it was that King Arthur took great joy in that forest land, for he was without ache or pain of any sort, and his heart was very greatly elated with the wonderfulness of the success of that adventure under which he had entered. For in that adventure he had not only won a very bitter enemy into a friend, who would be of great usefulness and satisfaction to him, but likewise he had obtained for himself a sword, the like of which the world had never before beheld. And whenever he would think of that singularly splendid sword, which now hung by his side, and whenever he remembered, remembered that land of fairy into which he had wandered, 
and of that which had befallen him therein, his heart would become so greatly elated with pure joyousness that he hardly knew how to contain himself because of the great delight that filled his entire bosom. And indeed, I know of no greater good that I could wish for you in all your life than to have you enjoy such happiness as cometh to one when he hath done his best endeavor and hath succeeded with great entirety in his undertaking. For then all the world appears to be filled as with a bright shining light, and the body seemeth to become so elated that the feet are uplifted from heaviness and touch the earth very lightly because of the lightness of the spirit within. Wherefore it is that if I could have in my power to give you the very best that the world hath to give, I would wish that you might win your battle, as King Arthur won his battle at that time, and that you might ride homeward in such triumph and joyousness as filled him that day, and that the sunlight might shine around you as it shone around him, and that the breezes might blow, and that all the little birds might sing with might and main as they sang for him, and that your heart also might sing its song of rejoicing in the pleasantness of the world in which you live. Now as they rode thus through the forest together, Merlin said to Arthur, Lord, which wouldst thou rather have? Excalibur, or the sheath that holds him? To which King Arthur replied, Ten thousand times would I rather have Excalibur than his sheath. In that thou art wrong, my lord, said Merlin, for let me tell thee, that though Excalibur is of so great a temper that he may cut in twain either a feather or a bar of iron, yet is his sheath of such a sort, that he who wears it can suffer no wound in battle, neither may he lose a single drop of blood, a witness whereof thou mayest remember that in thy late battle with King Pellinore thou didst suffer no wound, neither didst thou lose any blood. Then King Arthur directed his countenance of great displeasure upon his companion, and he said, Now, Merlin, I do declare that thou hast taken from me the entire glory of that battle which I have lately fought. For what credit may there be to any knight who fights his enemy by means of enchantment such as thou tellest me of? And indeed, I am minded to take this glorious sword back to that magic lake and to cast it therein, where it belongeth, for I believe that a knight should fight by means of his own strength, and not by means of magic. My lord, said Merlin, assuredly thou art entirely right in what thou holdest, but thou must bear in mind that thou art not as an ordinary errant knight, but that thou art a king, and that thy life belongeth not unto thee, but unto thy people. Accordingly, thou hast no right to imperil it, but shouldst do all that lieth in thy power for to preserve it. Wherefore, thou shouldst keep that sword so that it may safeguard thy life. Then King Arthur meditated that saying for a long while in silence. And when he spake, it was in this wise. Merlin, thou art right in what thou sayest, and for the sake of my people, I will keep both Excalibur for to fight for them, and likewise his sheath for to preserve my life for their sake. Nevertheless, I will never use him again, saving in serious battle. And King Arthur held to that saying, so that thereafter he did no battle in sport, excepting with lance and a horseback. King Arthur kept Excalibur as the chief treasure of all his possessions, for he said to himself, 
Such a sword as this is fit for a king above other kings, and a lord above other lords. Now as God hath seen fit for to entrust that sword into my keeping, in so marvelous a manner as fell about, so must he mean that I am to be his servant for to do unusual things. Wherefore I will treasure this noble weapon, not more for its excellent worth than because it shall be unto me as a sign of those great things that God in his mercy hath evidently ordained for me to perform for to do him service. So King Arthur made for Excalibur a strong chest or coffer, bound around with many bands of wrought iron, studded all over with great nails of iron, and locked with three great padlocks. In this strong box he kept Excalibur lying upon a cushion of crimson silk, and wrapped in a swathing of fine linen, and very few people ever beheld the sword in its glory, excepting when it shone like a sudden flame in the uproar of battle. For when the time came for King Arthur to defend his realm or his subjects from their enemies, then he would take out the sword, and fasten it upon the side of his body. And when he did so, he was like unto a hero of God girt with a blade of shining lightning. Yea, at such times Excalibur shone with so terrible a brightness, that the very sight thereof would shake the spirits of every wrongdoer with such fear that he would in a manner suffer the pangs of death ere ever the edge of the blade had touched his flesh. So King Arthur treasured Excalibur, and the sword remained with him for all of his life. Wherefore the name of Arthur and of Excalibur are one. So I believe that that sword is the most famous of any that ever was seen or heard tell of in all the courts of chivalry. As for the sheath of the blade, King Arthur lost that through the treachery of one who should by rights have been his dearest friend, as you shall hear of anon. And in the end, the loss of that miraculous sheath brought it about that he suffered a very great deal of pain and sorrow. All that also you shall read of, God willing, in due season. So endeth the story of the winning of Excalibur, and may God give unto you in your life, that you may have his truth to aid you, like a shining sword, for to overcome your enemies. And may he give you faith, for faith containeth truth, as a scabbard containeth its sword. And may that faith heal all your wounds of sorrow, as the sheath of Excalibur healed all the wounds of him who wore that excellent weapon. For with truth and faith girded upon you, you shall be as well able to fight all your battles, as did that noble hero of old, who men called King Arthur. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening.